Leadership at Work panel series. Today, our panel discussion will center on Pan-African Entrepreneurship at Work, Connecting African Ecosystems. My name is Alkidan Mulugeta, and I am the co-founder of Clear Skies ICT Consultancy, which is a value-added services company here in Ethiopia. Uh, we provide a gateway for parties that are interested in leveraging their mobile technology services. I will be your moderator for today's discussion on Pan-African Entrepreneurship at Work. And together with me are four panelists who I would like to briefly introduce. First, we have Salam Ayela, who is a director at Antler. Antler enables exceptional people to build impactful technology startups by helping form complementary co-founder teams, supporting teams with deep business model validation and providing a global platform for scaling startups to maximize their impact. Before joining Antler, Salam worked for various VCs and entrepreneurship support organizations across multiple geographies. Salam is passionate about technology, innovation, coffee, and Africa. Safito Sek is a fashion designer and an entrepreneur from Dakar, Senegal. And Safi created Saraya, a clothing line for women in uh, 2014. Safi is actually an economist by training and created Saraya to showcase unknown handwoven fabrics from countries such as Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, and to recognize the women and men who patiently weave um, these beautiful uh, her pieces. We have Salma Shimutuikemi. Selma is a natural resources law and policy expert. Selma creates value for public and private sectors by advising leaders on trade, inclusive policies, and strategy. Selma is the co-founder and managing director of Rich Africa Consultancy, which is a strategic company that specializes in natural resources law and policy and facilitates investment linkages. Last, but certainly not least, is Amadou Dafe, who is the CEO and co-founder of Gabaya Inc., a pan-African online talent marketplace that identifies the best of African talent and matches them with cutting edge projects from selective customers. In his previous life, Amadou co-founded uh, Coders for Africa to build the continent's largest software outsourcing company. Uh, today, I'd also like to uh, thank our gracious host, Adora Abdi, um, as you can see in the banner on my left side, your right side, uh, for providing their space to host this discussion. Um, Adora Abdi provides flexible working and living spaces here in Addis Ababa. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank ENCOPA, um, and the Jobs Creation Commission for providing us with this platform to have this discussion this morning. Thank you all and welcome to our panelists. So much like our continent, our panelists are quite diverse. Um, they come from various backgrounds, uh, work in different areas, and uh, we thought that the discussion would uh, be a lot more richer. Um, they come from uh, backgrounds that work in advancing policy on the continent, uh, building businesses from scratch, like I mentioned, uh, providing much needed equity, connecting African talent to interested customers and entrepreneurship. So I'm going to go straight right into the topic of discussion today, um, Pan-African Entrepreneurship at Work. And the first question I just want to ask, um, is given that entrepreneurship is obviously driven by creativity, initiative, and innovation, what cultural and institutional factors create an environment where entrepreneurship can thrive? And what kind of incentives are needed to support uh, the research development and commercialization of ideas? So I'm going to ask uh, Safi uh, and uh, followed by Salam. Of course, if anyone else wants to add to this, you're more than welcome. So Safi, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm super happy to be part of this initiative. So I think 
that um, we need to have um, an, envi an environment that is conducive, um, you know, for uh, entrepreneurs, you know, to, to prosper. Um, and for that, we need to have like enough government will, like the government to basically help, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, to do what they want to do. As far as Senegal is concerned, um, like in my industry, like creative industry, because I'm a fashion designer, um, like it's been very challenging because um, actually the government doesn't give an importance, you know, to creative industry because actually being a fashion designer is not a job, you know, when, <laughs> When I was growing up, you know, even you know, people surrounding me, um, even family, you know, when I said that I was actually wanting, I wanted to be a fashion designer, you know, people were not taking me seriously, and they were like, no, you know, you need to have a job, like a real job. So that's why I went and did, you know, some economic um, studies. You know that 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 was definitely not my passion. So um, when you 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 know you 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 are in an environment that actually doesn't necessarily believe because it's been very a challenge for me. You know, looking for you know finance, you know to you know financial tools and means you know to finance my business. You know, it's been you know the government was not here. You know, it, it was it was it was very difficult, and I believe I profoundly believe that um, you know an economy has to have a competitive um, and a comparative advantage that it can use in order for that economy to prosper. And I believe that Africa, especially Senegal, our competitive and comparative advantage is creative industries like uh, many other countries. So we need to, to exploit that. If you don't exploit that, if we don't sell what we can do best, then we, you know, we have a problem. So, and if you are in an environment that don't believe in that, well, and we're trying to do what other people do, like, okay, technology is very nice, but we always need new technology. But if we try to import whatever is not our competent competency, then we're trying to do to be something that we we are not really, and we will spend a lot of effort, you know, to to prosper in that. So what can't we just do what we do best and invest in that? So um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that was a challenge um, um, in, in Senegal and for. For us to prosper, we need to have the government around. We need to have, you know, all the agencies, you know, that can actually um, help us, you know, to basically do what we can do best. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I can jump in. Hey, Kathleen. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hey. Okay. So I can jump in. So your question had two things. So you said, what drives entrepreneurship and what kind of culture or institutional culture is required for, to, for entrepreneurship to thrive? And then the second part was, what are the incentives, right? So I kind of thought about it in those two blocks. So mm -hmm. the culture or the institutional, I guess, environment should be, there should be a very strong like, drive to solve problems. And, and there should be a culture that's not complacent. Otherwise, then you're not really motivated to, to build anything, right? So in addition to all the things that you mentioned about, you know, what uh, drives entrepreneurship with the creativity, the initiative, the innovation, I think at the core of it is the, the excitement, the ability, and the, the, the need to solve problems, right? So that, that culture needs to be there. In addition to that, um, there should also be an environment that promotes experimentation and an environment that provides like constructive feedback and not, um, you know, a lot of scrutiny as how we have back home, unfortunately. Um, and then most places actually, it's not, it's not just an Ethiopian thing, but most countries uh, across the continent, uh, most cultures across the continent 
and most traditional institutions are very, um, you know, demonizing, scrutinizing kind of uh, environment where you are not really allowed to fail or experiment. And that's super important to promote entrepreneurship. Um, and then the third thing maybe is a mindset that's extremely like open-minded and curious at all times. Otherwise you wouldn't have the, the room to even think about how would you come up with an innovative, uh, creative way to solve the problem, right? So that that like environment needs to be there to begin with. And then if that's there, then the other part is the incentives as you were saying. And, and, and uh, Sefi, you also mentioned uh, quite a lot of it, which is, you know, there should be favorable like conducive environments like the policies that are not penalizing for entrepreneurs to to kind of try out because no one really knows how this is going to work so you know don't tax them before they start making money right like that make it easy for people to really go out and experiment and and see if this idea if this business idea makes sense um don't penalize them for failing uh, because that's also part of as i was saying earlier that part of the a requirement to create this kind of supportive environment um, and most of all there should be a very um, collaborative environment because there are so many stakeholders that need to come into place for entrepreneurship to thrive so like again like from infrastructure to policies to uh, talent to I guess we'll, we'll talk about it leaders also to talent to um, access to finance to I guess even having a, a community or a, a market that understands what you're trying to do um, access to finding information and processing that information like to like a lot of things right like, so, so it's not one thing that that needs to be in place and, and entrepreneurship like especially in a very early stage you can't afford to do all of it by yourself. So the most important thing, um, the, the most um, necessary incentive there is also to be able to bring all these stakeholders together and, and create that um, space uh, for these entrepreneurs to you know, do what they do best, which is solve problems and, and do cool stuff. And hopefully some amazing things will come out of it. Thank you, ladies. Um, I think that's really good insights uh, to really also consider that enabling environment for entrepreneurs to just um, know that they can take a risk, that they can, that failing is not a bad thing, um, that it's just, uh, you know, one of the many paths to success. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, I'm just going to toss this to everyone else in the room, including Amadou, um, you know, how can we, you know, change our culture to, accept entrepreneurship, you know, as I, as we all know, you know, we all come from different parts of the continent. I think all of us represent, you know, East, South, West um, here. And sometimes in some cultures, entrepreneurship is actually looked at as uh, a failure. Like you could not get a full-time job or you weren't able to finish um, your education and therefore you go to entrepreneurship. And what are some very low hanging fruits that even the government and policymakers can um, can put in place in order uh, for for entrepreneurs to or for, for individuals to to move into entrepreneurship. I'll just open the floor to, to anyone. Um, maybe I'll jump in. Okay. Um, I think that perception is changing, eh, Kalkina. I think that. Um, governments in Africa understand that there's no. <laughs> She's talking in the background. That's an entrepreneur. Huh? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the governments in Africa understand that in order to create more jobs, that they can't do themselves, they have to. Uh, nurture entrepreneurship, they have to build ecosystems and so on and so forth. Both in uh, recently, past year or so, year and a half, Ethiopia and Senegal came out very strong with their Startup, Startup Act, you know, digital transformation strategies. So it's happening. I don't think the governments are confused there. But I think at the core of even the youth in Africa, everybody's a hustler. You go in the streets of Dakar, you see people selling. That's entrepreneurship. You come to Addis, you see some similarity, a lot of silk, a lot of small businesses doing their thing. 
So you have to look at it, what level of entre- entrepreneurship you're talking about. Is it the sexy entrepreneurship, you know, to start up a company, build it up to become a billion dollar? Or are we looking at those who are trying to just like build something small, make it work, essentially creating their own jobs, right? And I think that the government knows, most governments know that there's enough of those. In any African country, you have an informal market. Just women selling at the market, young people in the street hustling. So that's not the issue. But now the transition is how can governments see um, the opportunity of having those, I would call them high level, it doesn't mean they're better than the, the people selling on the streets, those high level people who want to create transformative, uh, what you call it, um, opportunity in the country. Let me give you an example in Ethiopia, one of the most transformative startup that I've seen in the past four or five years is Ride, right? With some Ride, right? Created an Uber Ethiopia. She has over, I think now, 30,000 drivers. Can you, a single person created 30,000 jobs in Ethiopia, right? Making good money, right? The average, I think, earning a day is 1,000 per, right? So there's an opportunity. Then you look at Senegal, there's a friend of mine there, you know, Bambalo, who created a company called Pops, right? Similar but more in logistics, delivery, right? When I was stuck there during COVID, you know, I was ordering my food to, to, to a company that uses services. So seeing those companies and supporting those entrepreneurs who can create jobs very quickly, I think that's what the government doesn't know how to do yet. So uh, uh, Salah mentioned three things that was interesting to me. You have the entrepreneur pillar, you have the capital, you have the talent. The entrepreneurs, we have plenty of them. We just have to figure out how to structure that, right? What's, what's been good now is the capital. We've seen that there's a lot of money coming into Africa recently. Just about a month ago, it was, uh, we've heard, heard the $6 billion companies in, in Nigeria, unicorns, right? Hoping to have something similar in a couple of years in Ethiopia. So the capital is coming strong. Even this year alone, half of the year, I think uh, it's been what, maybe $1.5 billion invested in startup, the sexy one, right? What's now, I think, critical is also to look at the talent meaning those people who actually help those companies get to a billion dollar company. So if you combine that with a foundational understanding from the government side that you can build companies in Africa that's worth a billion dollars, then I think it's a quick win. I hope I sort of answered the question. You did, and it, and it really leads on to the, the next question, which um, I wanted to highlight. One of these unicorns that we have, Flutterwave in Nigeria, uh, which interestingly enough did not exist five years ago. And now it's valued at $1 billion. So shifting now um, to something different, but that is, is critical to the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Uh, the co-founder, um, this is a quote that I'm gonna read, a flutter we've said that before the pandemic, this is a quote from him, uh, I'm sorry, co-founder of Flutterway. He states that before the pandemic, energy and space was the most expensive cost for entrepreneurs. This has now shifted to talent. There is an ecosystem that needs to centralize uh, the infrastructure to lower the cost of talent. And it goes on to say that the African ecosystem is thriving and that the biggest cost when it comes to building a business is now moving to talent. And Amadou, um, this is what you do day in and day out. Um, do you agree with the statements? Um, go ahead. Yeah, like I say, you can get all the money in the continent, but if you don't have the right talent to build your, your company, uh, you know, you, you're not going to make it. And Salam knows this, right? She's building a company that brings founders together and put them together, right? So, it's, but the talent you have to look at it two ways in Africa. It's very raw at, at the moment, in a sense where some of these talents never worked in their life, have the opportunities of being an internship and, and, and grinding and learning what it means to be on time, all kinds of stuff. So you have that raw talent. What the challenge is now, how do you take that raw talent and make it a little bit more productive in the next five years? This is where government, ed tech companies. Uh, not even ed tech, forget even technology, just having a good accountant for your startup is a challenge in Africa, right? In Ethiopia, if you build a company, yeah. it's about four or five firms that you can rely on, right? The other ones are expensive and I'm sure it's the same everywhere, right? You can't just walk in with your $100,000 mm-hmm. seed and try to hire someone for 30000 right? So that raw talent needs to be brought up to speed. And what for, if you look at a similarity in the U.S., what made sort of some of these big companies initially in the Valley worked 
It's because they rely heavily on India, right? It's not an accident today. The CEO of Google is Indian. The CEO, you know, I think he's stepping down though. Um, the CEO of uh, Microsoft is also Indian because they, they built up the infrastructure over the past 40 years. Uh, we, we have a problem. Uh, it's the chicken or the egg. How do we build the infrastructure of talent and at the same time build a billion dollar company? Uh, some of these Nigerian firms hire actually Ukrainian talents or some of those types, or they brought back diaspora from the US or Europe to run, to be CFO, CEO, and so on and so forth. I did it myself. I had to bring somebody from another country to actually become uh, one of the executives in my team. So it's a very challenging problem. And you can't sort of cheat. You can create all the ed tech um, platforms or government can go and reinforce universities and stuff like that. But it's not going to happen overnight. It's a mindset. It's a culture change. Now people are switching online. There's so much work to be done. I think we need to pay attention to it. As entrepreneurs, we just have to deal with what we can right now and maybe build different companies that don't rely on high, high paid talent, more like, uh, so for example, in Ethiopia, the, we say uh, the work of one, you have to hire two people, right? Maybe we'll do that for another five years <laughs> until you really find out one, one person that can do the work for 10 people. So it's a very, very, very challenging thing that I see every day. I hope that. Maybe Salam, you want to chip in on this one? Yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. I was just going to jump in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's definitely something where we get stuck, or at least, uh, okay. So we go to what two thousand applications per cohort to get thirty. Did we want to get thirty? Not really. We could have gone up to sixty, but like we stop at whatever great people we find and then we, we start the, the cohort right so that's that's very clear how important it is that even when you have the money and then you have the environment to promote this entrepreneurship if you don't have the right people in these teams it's just as bad as if everything else was not there right so and then not only once they join the cohort so once you invest in them the, the biggest challenge and find the right talent hire especially the early hires uh, who can come in and take big responsibility and, and run with this business right so i, I completely agree it's, it's such an important gap and um, i agree it's not going to be filled overnight but it's also good that we're having these conversations about it and seeing more and more people trying to kind of fill that gap from different directions um across across the continent as well but in the meantime we might have to bring the ukrainians now okay. we'll find them <laughs> This is, this is a, you know, a pertinent discussion that we have to have right now. Um, so I'm going to switch uh, gears a little bit to talk about physical capital, um, because I think all these things go hand in hand. We, one thing that we definitely, I can say, is uniform. There's not a lot of things that are uniform about the continent. But the one thing that I can say is, is uniform is that we are a resource-rich uh, continent. Um, all 54 countries, there's always something that is, is a value that perhaps we are not using to its fullest potential, right? And so if we term this as the physical uh, capital that we have on the continent, which is very key to entrepreneurship, um, if we look at it from the positive side, um, efficient physical infrastructure and access to natural resources uh, can represent critical inputs into the entrepreneurial process. Um, when we think of adding value to, to products, uh, when we think of, I mean, here in Ethiopia, um, coffee is huge with this. Um, how can we work together with government uh, and other stakeholders to create an environment, a better ecosystem for entrepreneurs, right? So Salma, maybe you can speak about your work um, as a natural resources expert and, um, you know, what kind of work you're doing and what kind of um, conversations we can we can have in this space. Uh, no, thank you so much, um, and uh, I really appreciate all the input from the other panelists. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, um, and I, I think I'm more of a social entrepreneur because my focus is on helping the public and private sector unlock the potential of our resources 
um, for the benefit um, of the wider society. And uh, it's a very, it, you know, it's a very, um, I can say it's a challenging, it's a challenging role because at the end of the day, you know, we have to leverage, you know, what we have as a continent. So on one side, we have this resource rich um, continent um, and unfortunately for decades or I can even say centuries, our model was very about, it's very export. We take raw materials and it builds other continents. Um, and that can range from, you know, um, for example, I serve on the, on, the, on the board to market um, and trade Namibian diamonds with some of the best diamonds in the world. Um, and then on the, then you, for example, you gave Galki, you gave a, um, an example of the coffee, you know? So how do we get from, you know, the coffee beans to coffee? You know, um, so in terms of my work is really helping um, the key stakeholders to look at the entire value chain of our resources and kind of drive this notion of sustainability, right? And sustainability goes beyond just the environmental aspect. It also looks at the social and economic impact of our resources. Um, so, I mean, progressive uh, nations, for example, such as Norway, have they've been able to you know, create funds from their resources uh, to diversify the economy. And I believe that Africa should be doing the same thing. Why are we not using our, you know, what the economic rent we're getting from our resources and putting it into entrepreneurship? Um, and I also think, I believe, uh, I think what Safi said earlier on, you know, in terms of leveraging what we have, you know, Af Africa is a creative continent. Um, we've been doing it for centuries. We've been, you know, um, providing the world with all the raw materials, but we do not get to a point of um, adding value. So in terms of your question about how we can work with government to create a better ecosystem, as well as to retain value, is to look at, when you look at each sector, look at the entire value chain, look at where we can participate um, as entrepreneurs, and then create uh, an enabling environment, um, whether it's stable, uh, legal and economic frameworks and incentivize private sector participation in the industry. Uh, and also, I mean, most importantly, um, even though I'm in the resources space in terms of what we have, our greatest resource on the continent is actually the human capital. Um, and we have the largest youth dividend in the world. How are we gonna unlock their potential? Um, and, you know, this comes to, you know, um, skills and education. And, and I think everyone touched on it. We need to change the mindset. <laughs> the traditional, I remember, you know, um, earlier on in my career, it's kind of, you know, the thing was to be a doctor, to be a lawyer. You know, that's kind of like the African mindset. Uh, but if we are to leapfrog, um, we will need to actually open up our minds and say, you know what, there are other ways of doing things. And just uh, before I move on, Kalki, I looked at um, a doing business report, a World Bank report, and the cost of doing business. So just to give context uh, to what everyone has said. So for example, in Rwanda is free, right? <laughs> In Namibia, where I am from, it's around uh, 446 US dollars to start a business. In South Africa, it's around 13 US dollars to start a business. In Ethiopia, it's um, $153. And then you have Equatorial Guinea, uh, where it is 2,322 US dollars to start a business. So when you're talking about creating an enabling environment and creating an ecosystem, I mean, I'm gonna look at where it's convenient and more competitive for me to start a business, but if we have all these disparities on the continent, how are we gonna create that ecosystem? So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Sama. I actually had a look at that, um, the map uh, on the cost of, of doing business and I, I want to know from your working with governments, is there, what's the acceptance like and how, uh, you know, what are the, those conversations been like on the ground? You know, when you show them a map like this and you show Equatorial Guinea, it's, we're talking $2,000 compared to um, 
you know, even Namibia, which is in the 400s, which is which is still yeah. quite high, mm -hmm. uh, to Rwanda, which is zero. What has been the? Is there an acceptance? Is there a willingness to listen? Is there, you know, do you feel like your work and where you sit and the sort of leverage you have, um, does it work? And if you can provide, it'll be even better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think like in, in my in, the, in my industry, I mean, you have, you know, it's it's kind of like finding the mutual benefits. So, for example, in the you know oil and gas and mining space, the access to entry is super high because it's capital intensive and high risk. Um, so many of the the private sector will be you know negotiating, for example, on taxes. So creating incentives to bring in um, you know companies to unlock the potential. Uh, and then what, the kind of the debate, you know, when, when you engage, you know, government is that, you know, we, we do not work in isolation. You know, we are, we are part of a wider community and someone is gonna say, I'm gonna go to Angola instead of coming to Namibia, for example, you know, based, based on your policies. Um, and of course, I mean, Rwanda is just very competitive at this point in time. So I think because of what is being seen elsewhere, um, the governments are taking notice that they have to create an enabling environment that stimulates private sector investment. And um, I think the, the most important thing is literally, um, you know, we have this um, African Union vision. You know, we have, we have this, uh, the, we have the vision for regional integration at the continental level uh, with the different economic blocks. And those documents, they are very clear on where we want to go as a continent. <laughs> the issue is implementation and getting the countries to do it. Um, so on the 1st of January, um, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement um, was signed. And so we are, we are striving towards the single market. And, uh, and just to give just a side, a side story, a few years ago, so something basic, just trying to get shea butter <laughs> from Burkina Faso to trade it in Namibia. Um, so of course got very excited <laughs> uh, to trade shea butter. And then you realize, oh my goodness, transportation costs. Like it's not feasible. And these are the learning curves of an entrepreneur, you know? Uh, and I know under the, the free trade agreement, one of the key initiatives is creating an app where traders can buy a good from another African country, but still pay in their national currency. You know, so I think implementation is the key, but um, the governments are waking up to the fact that it is competitive and they have to create, you know, job, they, they need to stimulate job creation. Yeah. Thank you for that, Fama. I always think about, um, for example, Ethiopian Airlines, between Ethiopian Airlines and uh, Kenya Airways, I think they cover most of the continents. And every single day, they're traveling to different parts. And there's a whole section of the plane that we could utilize for, um, for transportate, transportate, uh, transporting all these goods um, that we want to trade. Um, I think these are sort of discussions that we really need to um, leverage and lobby because if these airlines are traveling there on a daily basis, at least the transportation is one point, and then maybe we can have another discussion on, on the taxation and, you know, and the customs and, and whatnot. Um, but just going into that, I know Safi, um, through Saraya, you work with um, artists in different African countries, and do you also, um, you also sell your work to many different African countries. So I'd like to hear as an entrepreneur working in, in fashion, right? In a, in a field that is, is growing rapidly on the continent, um, could you share um, some of the models that you've used uh, that maybe have even come naturally to you um, in creating these ecosystem, ecosystems among um, African countries? So um, over to you, Safi. Um, uh, thank you for this question. Um, I, as I said at the beginning, uh, like um, my training um, is like I'm an economist and 
even though I was not passionate about what I was doing, it actually helped me um, see the potential that the African continent has. And one of them that I'm passionate about is, you know, the creative industry, you know, being, um, uh, you know, a fashion designer. Um, I had to look, you know, uh, what are the, um, the thing that, you know, we, we are cap capable of doing, like, and as far as Senegal is concerned, the West, all the West Africa, African region is handwoven fabric and Ethiopia actually is actually good, you know, in doing that. So I had to integrate that in the business model. So whatever you do, you do best and whatever you have abundantly has to be part of your, you know, um, of, of your model. So um, Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, you know, all of those countries and actually and Nigeria also, um, you know, do, you know, handwoven fabrics. So, and I'm very fond of this type of, um, you know, products. So in my business model, I had to integrate that, you know, in it, you know, to be basically best at what, what I, uh, at what I do. Um, I'm, Senegal is lucky to be, Senegal is basically a fashion destination. Senegal is a fashion destination, you know, women like, you know, to dress. And we have a lot of fabric, local fabric that are imported. And actually I would say that um, world fabric actually end up in Senegal, you know, the, you know, because we have a lot of um, business people who import them, but also uh, we have fairs, uh, two fair, um, where you have people from Burkina and people from uh, Mali who actually come and, and come and sell, you know, their, their um, you know, their fabric. So that I've been very lucky, um, you know, as far as that is concerned. So I basically use whatever we have locally, and that is extremely important because I, I, I know all the designers who actually go to Dubai or to, who go to Paris or whatever, and, 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 and you know, um, and come and, and like import them in Senegal. And that's very difficult because it's costly, you know, uh, you know, putting fabric in your suitcase where you, have, you only have like 23 kilo, even that times two, that is to me that that is not sustainable. So as far as fabric are concerned, I don't, I do not import fabric at all. I just, and fabric is what 90% of what I do. So I, 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 so to me, that, that, that is very important. And, I've, and I'm traveling a lot and I have the possibility to see all the fabric and I'm tempted. But to me in my head, you know, it, it, it is just not sustainable. So that's what I would say, because a lot of uh, people that are uh, actually in, in my business, you know, a lot of fashion designers have a lot of uh, uh, challenges and this is one of them because they don't understand that, uh, you know, you really have to, exploit what is around you and what is not what is not around you is you know is, is going to be a challenge you know for you to have a sustainable business so yeah interesting and I think it also touches on um what you said touches on what Salam mentioned that it takes um you're using your creativity right exactly. so you're allowing yourself to use you know, whatever resources that they are in your neighboring countries, within your country. Um, Safi, what, where are your customers? If you don't mind me asking for, for Saraya, you built this brand over the last six years. Um, are you, do you mainly, are your customers there in Senegal or outside? And, and what is that like promoting your business um, to, okay. to your customers? Okay, so, okay, 90% of my, of my customers, are outside of Senegal. 80% of them are in Africa. Uh, and the rest, and the rest, uh, you know, is outside, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, so in my business model, I thought, okay, um, you know, I, 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 you know, having no money or what or whatsoever, you know, to do the marketing or whatever or whatsoever. I, I thought, okay, what I need to do is to, you know, to, to, to basically take the, the plane and I have friends and this is all, you know, another resource. I have friends 
And um, I would call them and I would tell them, okay, listen, like, you know, I, I would like to do a private sale. You know, can you help me do one? And, and that's what they would do. So that it, it, the only thing I need to do is basically, you know, pay a plane ticket. And then you know go there and having you know people and see and come up and and see and, and come you know uh, come and see my my brand, and these people will actually talk about my brand to other people. So that's how I've been working you know on on it, and it's been basically working pretty well. So when we talk about resources, yeah, definitely uh, people and friends have been an amazing resource for me because they have uh, helped me you know expand and talk about you know and. Yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Incredible. And uh, I just have to give a shout out. Your designs are beautiful. I encourage everyone to go and look at, you know, at your website, at your social media pages, Saraya. Beautiful. So folks, we're going to take a brief intermission of uh, a minute and a half. One of the things that ENCOPA stands for is also promoting entrepreneurship here in Ethiopia. So I'm going to Medin, our host, to please uh, play the video for a local company, a local private uh, sector company here in Ethiopia. Thank you. It provides efficient taxi services by women drivers to corporate and individual clients in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. The name Saragella means Chariot and the company was founded in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 2020. We are proud to be an employer of individuals from different walks of life who are committed to providing reliable services. The bedrock of our company are women drivers who provide safe, comfortable and reliable services to each and every one of our passengers. Our vehicles are sedan 2020 models. As women comprise more than half the population in Ethiopia, it's our duty to ensure we are providing the necessary employment opportunities. Empowering women in the workforce will have an immediate positive effect for families and for the country as a whole. Seregela provides training to women drivers. As a technology and transportation company, we also promote digital inclusion by ensuring the use of our mobile applications and our web panels by both our drivers, call center staff, and customers. We are back. Um, so this is our final um, half of, of this panel discussion. And um, I want to start by highlighting the global companies that are coming into the continent, right? So we have, um, I think in West Africa, recently Ghana set up shop, I mean, a Twitter set up shop in Ghana. Um, Google, uh, Google has been around um, on the continent in several countries um, uh, in West Africa and East Africa. Um, and then we also have uh, African companies that are also broadening their reach across the continent such as Pharma that are doing a lot of um, mergers with local companies in different countries in Africa. And then if you're here in Ethiopia, I think the most exciting news in the last two months has been the Global Partnership for Africa, which is the new telecom that's um, going to start here in, um, in, in Ethiopia, which is led by Safaricom. Um, so this question is more so to Amadou, um, and I also, also open the floor to other panelists. Um, how can entrepreneurs and small businesses best prepare to, to partner with these global companies that are coming? Um, what do you think the role of private sector is in skill development, in um, you know, just informing and um, both governments and employers to address any um, issues with skills mismatch and just ensuring that um, entrepreneurs and Africans are actually going to be the beneficiaries of all these companies that are coming in with capital to spend. Um, go ahead, Amadou. Right, so how can entrepreneurs work with these global companies? Hmm. That's a very, very tough question. I don't think um, some of us, uh, small companies can compete. So, the obvious thing is probably get acquired 
Um, if they build out infrastructure that allows us to work better, maybe. That's a very tough question. Huh? Um, one of the things I always say, the reason why I started the business in Ethiopia is because it allows me to build my business without worrying about you know, too many big companies or foreign companies coming over and tipping onto my market, right? But that's changing. <laughs> You know, in any, any other African countries, you you know, it's dominated by foreign companies, right? You go to Senegal, where Safi is, I'm sure she'll tell you French dominate, right? Um, anywhere from banking to even supermarkets, right? Uh, they popping up everywhere in, in, in the car. Uh, Kenya, where Salam is, you know what, what it is there. They, 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 but Ethiopia has this luxury where it's still sort of hard to start a business, even though it's, it's, it's cheap for a local business to start, but if you're a foreigner, you know, you better bring a, maybe $100,000, $200,000 to start a business. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to see how these companies are gonna help entrepreneurs. Maybe one of the things we were lucky to have as in my company, we had a company like Orange, uh, the telco company, which has a venture called Orange Venture, invest in us, right? So that, that worked out, right? They own equity part of Gaber. Uh, where they allowed, well, the deal was they allowed us to sort of navigate through their affiliates, right? So if I wanted to have uh, business with Orange, say, Zimbabwe, if, if they're there, then they'll make that happen for me, right? So investment, I think, is one of the things we can leverage. Most of these companies do have ventures. I believe even Safaricom has a venture fund that can invest into these startups. Um, so, so that's, that's that. And the second question is skill development through this. So one of the things that I hope that when a global company comes to uh, uh, an African country, the government should say, listen, at least hire 50% of your staff from that country. Um, if you don't do that, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a bunch of expats coming in and taking over, which is detrimental. Because then you have these people who are not trained, who are not exposed to what it means to work you create a gap. So, and maybe force some of these global companies to open up training institutions, right? That's, I think that should be in any mandate that if you're gonna invest in an African country, you should have a training institution to go along with that. Not for just for you, but for the rest of the, I think Microsoft does that very well. They're done it with the Microsoft for Africa initiative, which we're able sort of to plug in. So skill development is, is, is tough. Is really, really tough because I'm in it, right? I can tell how hard it is to take someone from entry level to become a junior, um, but it's going to be interesting. So this story about global companies coming in Africa is not new. It's only new maybe to Ethiopia. Um, and we have to navigate it in a way where um, we benefit from it the most. Um, the, the, from an entrepreneur perspective, again, I'm going to repeat myself. Uh, the battle is, for example, if you're building a fintech company in Ethiopia right now and Safaricom is coming, if they build Mpesa as well. Yeah, so so I'm not very clear in my answer, but I hope I give you enough things to chew on, yeah? Yeah, but, I mean, I think um, from our conversations, you, you recently launched a, a sort of a, like an online marketplace for talent. Do you want to talk about that maybe and, and just how to ease that um, that search for talent, for example, um, on, on, on one end. And congratulations, by the way, on, on launching that. Thank you. Yeah, it hasn't been um, easy yet. Yeah. The, the website crashed a couple of times. So, <laughs> so um, we're yes. very familiar with that. <laughs> so, yeah, why a freelance marketplace? So, it's a freelance marketplace. People are familiar with Upwork, Fiverr. We don't have a proper Pan African freelance marketplace in Africa. We do have marketplaces that exist in context within the country they're in. For example, Nigeria has a bunch of them. Uh, Kenya has a few. Ethiopia has some, but it's very sort of not clear yet. But a Pan-African one, meaning if I'm in South Africa, can I hire an Ethiopian talent and so on and so forth? And why is it possibly interesting now? Because of the concept of what the nature of remote work, right? It's, it's sort of dominated the conversation in the past two years, um, almost two years uh, since COVID. And then the concept of now future of work, how would people work? Where would you hire your talent from? 
if you're in a country like Senegal and you're not finding your right talent locally, what do you do, right? Do you, what do you do? Maybe you can look at a, a, a platform that allows you to do, to do that. Why freelance rather than straight up hire? Because of the scarcity or, or the, the, the scramble for talent in the continent. People are scrambling for the same exact talent. So if you don't have something that's a little bit more, for every startup, what I believe in, you have to have your core team and you have to have people around you that you can tap in and out, right? Consultants and stuff like that. And this consultant, consultant mindset does not exist much in Africa at the youth level. Everybody wants a job, nine to five, you know, but that concept of having a nine to five, if you live in Ethiopia, is very hard to get those kinds of jobs. So what are you going to do? So you have to readjust yourself and say, maybe I can do some freelance work for this company in Nigeria and so on and so forth. So we decided to build this platform to give a base to consultants across the continent, the world, and subscribe to a platform like Upwork. They have two, three million freelancers there. You disappear into that. You know, but if you're in Africa and you serve an African market, you have a better chance to win. So it's a very interesting challenge that I'm solving right now. I need all the help I can get um, to get there. Um, we're trying to get to 15,000 talent in the next three years. We're close to 1,000. Um, with the kind of investors I have, the support we have in the continent, the demand, the demand is there. Everybody's looking for talent on a daily basis. We've done a quick study of all the major job recruitment sites in the continent weekly. And on average, you have 5,000 open jobs just in tech, let alone if you look at you know, business, right? Um, so it's a very interesting problem to, to solve. And yeah, so we are there. Well, that's a very interesting problem. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I just want to move on to, um, to, to Salam. Salam on a daily basis is in the business of building companies from scratch. Um, at Antler. And um, I want to ask you, Salam, about medium-sized businesses um, and the potential that they have to boost demand for regional goods and services, as well as drive innovation, uh, um, create and point development. I saw um, on your LinkedIn that you recently launched um, through Antler you helped launch a company called, I want to say, AI Influence, Influence. Um, which I think is spread out in many different countries in Africa, yeah. um, or is growing. So, you know, to be successful, businesses require a combination of various things, such as um, legal, institutional incentives, infrastructure, equity, obviously, um, and preferably even, you know, African financing partners who understand the, the scope and, and the environment best. So in your day-to-day -day engagement um, with Antler and even um, you know, in other spaces that you're involved in, how, um, what has this experience been like? Right. Um, hmm. <laughs> there are a lot of things. I'm, I'm going to also try, try to answer like each of them. So to talk about my day-to-day -day now, um, as you mentioned, so Antler primarily is a venture capital firm, but it's a, a VC with a bit of a twist where we don't invest in existing businesses. Instead, we bring in individuals who demonstrate exceptional skill sets either in the business or in technology. So when like the average person has 10 years of work experience, They've built businesses before, like about 20% of the board has made a business or had built a business that made about a million dollar revenue in their previous life. So these are not, you know, the average fresh grads from college or people with zero experience, but we identify those kind of exceptional talent and people who are looking to build a new business, bring them in and then help them find their co-founders, first of all, second, help them refine their business idea. And third, they have an opportunity to, to raise a, our VC investment, which is $100,000. And all of this happens in two and a half months. So essentially we touch up on all of the things that you've mentioned earlier. So maybe I can, I can give you like how the day-to-day -day kind of works. 
first of all, so Antler is now in 14 locations. Antler itself is a startup. It started about three years ago, not fully three years, so two and a half years, but we've been able to do this. Now, 14 countries built about and invested, built about a thousand business ideas, and we've invested now in 400 across the globe. Um, but then Nairobi office started August 2019. We are currently on our fourth cohort. We actually have our investment committee meeting starting next week. So fourth cohort is ending, but we do like two cohorts a year. And a few things, right? So first, from day one, we're looking to build Pan-African startups, meaning as a VC, scale is so important. And when I say scale, it's not just how many customers this ideas would, would this businesses would have, but also how many geographies can they easily enter. Um, and that's why we also focus specifically in tech enabled, tech powered startup ideas. So it could be in any sector, but we need to be sure that they're leveraging technology to enable them to scale fast across the continent. And the second thing is when we're recruiting, like I was mentioning earlier, we get about 2000 applications per cohort. We pick about 30, max 40 uh, so far, and about 80% come from across the continent, about 14 countries in the current cohort, for example. Um, so by nature, the teams, when they end up being formed, they would have at least one person who's not like from the same country. If it's a team of three, maybe two people are from the same country, the third person from elsewhere. So that also creates that infrastructure where the co-founding members are already Pan-African. So that makes it very easy for them to scale, say it's a team of Kenya and Nigerian. And then so the next market would be easy for them to enter it would be Nigeria. So that kind of architecture that we were able to build from day one is extremely important in building already Pan-African companies. Um, you mentioned something about investment. That's also exceptionally uh, you know, important where I, I might be mistaken, but we think we're the, the earliest VC in this continent because we're investing on air, <laughs> like on people, like basically betting on these guys and the pitch deck that we kind of built with them for the past two weeks, two months. So essentially like our team was involved from before the teams even, this individuals even met before because we're recruiting them. And then once they bring them together, we're also helping them refine the idea and then we invest, right? So being able to provide the financial um, support before anyone would even look at you. At this point, when all other VCs would say, what's your traction? But at this point, we're really betting on the founders and our core uh, like investment thesis is that we invest in exceptional people and exceptional teams. So that also makes it easier for a lot of founders to kind of, as I was saying earlier, to fail, to experiment, and to have the space that is supportive and encouraging and, and I guess constructive for them to not, without having to worry about where am I gonna get that money from? If we really believe the team is solid and the idea is, is fantastic, there's big, big enough market size, all other VC metrics, then you know we bet on you basically. So that's that's another way that we're supporting these entrepreneurs on the day on the daily. And then the other thing is again, we're very critical about which ideas end up getting investment, and we put our bar pretty high by design. So we only look at ideas that have a potential to become a unicorn from day one. So it's not like, oh, the idea is not going to make money. It's a question of, is this a $100 million business or is it going to be a billion dollar business if everything goes well, right? So it doesn't mean all of them will become unicorns, but at least from day one, if you can help them think like that and go after big market, big enough market size, then you're already planting the seed for them to grow into it, right? So we understand that maybe 1% of the portfolio would end up being a unicorn, but uh, this kind of gives you the room to, to play around this, this potential from, from, from the beginning. And that's also one of the reasons why we don't necessarily invest in existing businesses. We, we were not there. We were not there when the teams decided. Usually it's like, oh, friends or, you know, my husband and I thought this is a great idea and it's a bakery invest in us like it's great <laughs> you're building that but it's not going to scale and unfortunately it's not going to be that big because you're not you know you haven't thought about it in that kind of uh, plan right so that I, I think that's the other way of promoting this like big 
hairy dream entrepreneurs to come to to the cohort and then we we hopefully get some and, and if I if I could go back and see what the track record is like so far like I said three courts have passed now we've invested in 10 teams um, out of like 40 teams that were formed through the program and out of the 10 seven have already raised full-on investment the one that you saw yesterday was the, the biggest by far which is a, a million dollar seed round and just I want to say nine months since they launch. So this is the speed that we're looking at. And, and it is possible if you do have first the right individuals, then the right team, those individuals have made, and then they're, they're the right team idea fit. And then you give them the money and then you have the environment for them to, to grow that fast. But it requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of understanding of the market. Uh, it requires a lot of, I guess, time and effort and energy to support them. But when you do that, it's it's possible to see that, yes, in less than two years, we we're able to build 10 companies that are now hired more than 50 people, which is which is pretty, pretty exciting for us. So that's how I like do this on the daily. It's a lot of work, but it's it's super exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I think every African country needs an answer. Um, and you know, for anyone who's also listening to um, that, the, the audience, um, I think Salam has just laid out what it takes to join the cohort and become the next uh, unicorn in Africa. So um, I, I, in case I did not mention for the audience, if you have any questions to any of the panelists, please put uh, it in the chat. Um, I think there is some engagement from Rahel who mentioned the single African air transport market that needs to be implemented as part of the African Continental Trade Agreement. I agree. <laughs> and um, she mentioned also about uh, Safaricom and the fact that um, Ethiopia is mostly limited to higher managerial positions and positions where skills are not available. So Amadou, you talked a little bit about that and a duty to transfer knowledge is a requirement. Thank you. If anyone else has a question, please uh, put it in the chat. So my final question goes to all the panelists. Um, and this is also touching on, you know, these, these bodies and these organizations that have been created across um, the African continent to facilitate trade um, and to basically, you know, facilitate the moving of goods, services. Um, so some of them um, that you know probably from the respective region that you, you, you live in, ECOWAS um, in West Africa, SADAC in the southern part of Africa and uh, Central Africa, COMESA, um, which is also in South and Eastern Africa, um, EAC, which is mostly in East Africa. And I just want to ask the panelists here, um, whether your organization or your business has leveraged any of these bodies. Um, I think, uh, you know, if it has, the floor is up to you. And maybe, and now with the African uh, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, if this is something that interests your organization or you as an entrepreneur, um, and what other low-hanging fruits these organizations could, could think about. One of the things when I was preparing for this uh, discussion, I, I saw, um, you know, back in, back in the day, <laughs> before the colonialists came, we used to do a lot of trade in Africa, you know, so this is not new to us, you know, this is not a new discussion. There was a lot of trade, um, trans-Saharan trans trade, trade even to Europe. Um, I wish I had the graph with me, the map with me right now, but it's, it's, it's just a quick Google search. So this is not something new to the continent. Unfortunately, a lot of the borders and the barriers and visa restrictions and, and what have you, have limited the flow of goods. And we all know that intra-African trade and um, as we know it in goods and services is, is the lowest compared to that of in Europe and in Asia. Um, but now things are changing, you know, and I think in a post-COVID world, we, um, as the example of the co-founder of Flutterwave, we have had to leverage, we had to leapfrog in leaps and bounds and even use technology, the internet, so my first question is uh, to the panelists again is have you have you ever leveraged any of these bodies and you know what kind of message do you have for our governments and for these bodies to what what low hanging fruits are there 
So I'm just going to do a quick round. I think you can do it in the order of, of, of your names. We'll start with Amadou this time. Go to Safi, Salam, and then Salma. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think I never leverage any of these organizations just because I don't understand their the structure within which they were founded, right? Uh, not that, you know, what it means like ECOWAS, ECA, whatever, is, is I need to know the, sort of the original thought process behind it. Now, one thing I can tell you is I think technology is a catalyst for us to do Africa intertrade. Quick example, a um, bunch of Nigerian companies are hiring Ethiopian talent remotely, my talent. The reason why, very simply, Ethiopian talent is a little cheaper, right, than Nigerian talent. Second, some of these Nigerian companies don't trust their own talent locally because there's this feeling now, especially the tech one, that you hire them for two to three months, they realize they can make money somewhere else and bounce, right? So whereby Ethiopia is a little bit more sort of trying to find itself and, and they want to prove themselves to these, to these startups that they're working with. And there's three things happening there. Number one, um, um, Selma was talking about paying in their own currency. So these Nigerian companies are paying us in Naira, but it gets converted when it gets wired, right, to Kenya, which is the bank account. We take the, the dollars there, then we send the money to our talent in Ethiopia. So we are doing this inter-trade in terms of transaction, which is going to be my biggest challenge is how to figure out how to have maybe 20 different African countries where talents are, where clients are, paying each other within my platform. That's something that if I solve, yeah. So that's that first thing that happens. Second, culture. Like I say, Nigerians are looking at Ethiopia like, hmm, this young woman or this young person is very, very talented in Ethiopia. You know, how can I bring him? One, talent, one of the companies they call Limestar wanted to import this Ethiopian talent from Ethiopia to Nigeria to work for. You see? So they started seeing the culture is different. But one of the things is Ethiopian culture is very sort of reserved. They don't speak up much. So there's this challenge, which is Nigerian entrepreneur who has a lot of energy, where they're in the meetings, the Ethiopians are very quiet. So they're trying to understand that. So that intercultural exchange is very interesting to us. And then the location. You don't need to move anymore to do things, right? So in that regard, what happens is, I don't know, I'm not looking at all the different organizations, even the AU. When we get to a point where you're moving $300 million across these, all of these countries, you are, you are sometimes moving people, which you don't move them. The questions of passports, the questions of Forex, uh, uh, transfer pricing, all these different things. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how these, how these organizations can help organizations like us. Even Safietu maybe may say the same thing when she has a platform where she's selling goods online. If an Ethiopian company has good fabric that they want to export out to Ghana and then she sits in Senegal, you know, all this complexity, I don't, I don't know how, how's it going to work out or how, who do I talk to in that case, right? So, so I gave it some thoughts. I looked at the, the trade agreement. It's very vague. And again, I'm not anti-government. You know, I'm a private guy, private sector guy. You know, um, maybe that's a good problem to have at some point to reach out to these guys when I reach a peak. Maybe I'd, I'd like to hear what the other people have to say about that. Uh, what I can say about my experience, I have not been able to basically take advantage of those um, trade agreements. Um, it's been a challenge, for example, to go to Ivory Coast and to sell there. Like, for example, I can put some stuff on my suitcase, um, go at the airport, and just being stuck at the airport because um, you know I have some selling items. Whereas the trade agreement there tells me that I can actually sell, you know, in every coast uh, without you know paying customs. So, and I've been um, sending um, using like companies like Dashen, uh, you know, to basically sell, you know, in um, you know in newer more countries. Um, and clients, you know, calling me and tell me, well, I need to call, I need to basically pay at the custom. It doesn't make any sense and they're not supposed to. So yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge and we have a long way um, to go. And Amadou, I 
completely understand what you're talking about. So yeah, that's what I have to say. I think it was me, uh, Alki, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but I, I also would like to echo the, the, what everyone said. Uh, honestly, we've never really looked at these yet, mainly if because we work with tech, tech and tech enabled startups. So it's not necessarily a block yet. And, and Amadou, we have one startup that's doing intra Africa payments. <laughs> so as soon as we invest, I'll tell you. <laughs> But it's it's it is yeah the biggest challenge that's coming out is being able to pay um, across the continent right to, either in your own currency or not and we actually see that with most of the startup ideas that are being raised at Antler almost every other every cohort has some some form of enabling paying across currencies in Africa so that tells you a lot about where a lot of the entrepreneurs are at, where their head is at, and where the biggest, uh, oops, sorry, the power went out, <laughs> Africa. Um, but yeah. You can still so, hear you, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, good, because I hope the Wi-Fi doesn't go out. Um, but yeah, I, I was just saying, yeah, I was saying that it's, it's something that is coming up every time. So I think it's in, the, in everybody's mind that the, allowing this intra-Africa trade or requires allowing intra africa currency exchanges or being able to pay each other uh, without having to go through SWIFT uh, to a New York NYC or, or other African bank, uh, European banks to be able to transact with each other. I think the East African community does better because you can easily buy and sell you know, from Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, I, I guess, but the, not necessarily been an issue yet and we haven't looked at it, but I expect some some of the new startups will be disrupting that market until someone blocks them. Hopefully they won't, but we'll see. <laughs> um, yes, Kalki Dan. So yeah, um, I haven't um, you know leveraged any of the of the bodies. Um, you know, for my business. But from my observation is that, because I take part in a lot of these conversations where the policymakers, they will go on and on about um, SADAC or the Continental Free Trade Agreement. And I think the, the main issue is there's a disconnect between the policymakers and the entrepreneurs. And I think for, for us to unlock the potential of the continent and with the intra-Africa trade, they need to talk to the entrepreneurs on the ground to understand what are the needs. Because the danger we face is that, you know, the big international companies will come in and leverage and benefit from this agreement. And then the entrepreneurs do not participate in it. Um, also, we have a, another issue is that we have a huge informal sector on the continent, amazing traders. You know, are they part of the, the conversation? How do we fit them in into these agreements? So I think, you know, we need more, um, not only dialogue, but, you know, case studies where you actually engage the entrepreneurs to tell you, this, this is my challenge. Why can't I get, you know, this product in this country? You know, this is my experience and how do we, you know, remove the constraints? So yeah, they are great and aspirational. I mean, it's a good start. And you're right, we've been trading for centuries, only that we are, you know, we are divided by these borders. Um, and I think also in terms of, you know, when I was in Nairobi, I could, I could tell that, you know, the, the, the East, East, is it, is it, is it what, what's your block? East Africa community. Yeah, pardon me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, your, that, that block, it, it works more in practice. I could tell, you know, my friends were trading between countries and I was kind of like, you know, amazed because I mean, Southern Africa is not the case. It, it's difficult um, even, you know, to go to certain countries, I need a visa. Um, then you have the language barrier, then there's a culture barrier. Um, and then there's the inf inadequate infrastructure. I mean, we do have, you know, world-class infrastructure but it's still difficult to trade between countries unlike you know, West Africa and East Africa. Um, so yeah, that, that's my point. I just think that we need 
you know, um, you know, engagement here from the entrepreneurs on the ground and then create solutions for them. That's agreed, agreed. And I, I like your example, Salma, of talking to a lot of traders, especially in these border towns. You know, if you look at, um, if you go to Goma, the border of Rwanda and um, Congo, there's, there's so much activity there. If you look at Moyale, you know, and also even just looking at what kind of activity goes on there and, and learning, getting best practice from, from them because that's, that's what they do every day. So I know we have about three minutes left. Uh, there's a question from the audience to Amadou uh, from Amadit Tita. And Amadou, um, the question is, what has been the response or interest from the market in terms of procuring talent from Gabea's marketplace? Is there hesitation or biased preference for resources or expertise from outside the continent? And how do you manage that? Right. So I think people are waiting for, we're waiting for a platform like Gabea to be, to be up and running. Yeah? Um, the response we had, we launched the, the client platform about three, three weeks ago. And like I said, the website crashed a couple of times. Uh, on, we also have a talent app, which I think when we, when we announced the client app was launched, we had about 6,000 people install the app. So people are looking from a, from a talent side, which is the supply. I think that we hit jackpot. Everybody's looking for a gig in these African countries. Uh, they may have even have a job, but they want something on the side because they're not paid very well. So that's the jackpot. The, the demand side in Africa is a little bit trickier because like I say, people want to hire people permanently. They don't quite understand what the freelance market um, talent is yet. It's a bit tough even calculating, you know, you, you try this out and uh, it was difficult to kind of convince you. So the demand is there, uh, it's just that we're still trying to crack it, just to give you numbers. The freelance marketplace um, size in terms of industry is $1.5 trillion globally. And Africa only affects about 1% of that. So we just like sort of the virgin market for freelance. Can you imagine $1.5 trillion? Africa only 1%. The US alone, 40% of the population, of working population in the US are freelancers. People don't realize that, right? There's not enough company to absorb these guys, so they have to create their own jobs through freelancing. So there's a tremendous opportunity. That's why the demand is extremely large. Now, in terms of the bias, maybe, 50% of our clients are not African. They're from Europe, US, uh, especially Nord uh, the Nordics a little bit, France. That's why we have a sort of French and English type of talent freelance type of talent pool. So that just gives you, right? So at the end of the day, you are a startup in France and you need someone to speak French, a digital market expert, the buyers anymore. Everybody's connected online. You get into the platform, you order your talent and then you start working. So I'm not worrying about bias anymore. Four years ago, yes. It was like, you have to convince people that actually Africans know how to code, know how to do certain things. But now with COVID, everybody's connected somehow. You, you don't even know where you're a personal assistant is sitting. The advantage we have also, some of us in the Anglophone region, we speak a better English in terms of less of an accent. And if you go to India, so there's been an advantage for us. If you have French speaking uh, talent also, if you sit in Senegal, Senegalese people are known to get better French with less accent than someone from somewhere else. So we have this sort of thing that's playing out very nicely. I'm just looking forward for the next three years to see how we can crack it further and really make Africa the centerpiece of some of the best freelancers uh, in the world. Thank you, Amadou. Um, this concludes our panel discussion. Um, I have learned so much from all of you panelists. So I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank Ancopa for this um, opportunity to speak to these brilliant individuals. Uh, personally, I don't think we have even scratched the surface of um, these discussions that need to continue happening. Um, it, 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 this is a really good introduction, but I hope that we can continue having um, these discussions and engaging with people who are actually on the ground who are doing the work. So I'm, I'm very grateful to, to everyone who um, shared their insights. I'm grateful to the audience. Um, thank you so much, Adore, for hosting us today. Um, and have a great weekend.
Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Copper is the movement of Ethiopian entrepreneurs and innovators. A network of daring entrepreneurs transforming the way we live. Work and play. An emerging hub with best-in-class facilities. Built by the best in class. NCOPPER is where culture meets creativity. Where inspiration meets disruptive innovation. And where bold ideas and big dreams yield unique solutions. NCOPPER is connecting Ethiopia to Africa and Africa to the world. We're learning and adapting fast. And you can join a growing community of founders, investors, and world builders reimagining the future. Together, let's embark on an adventure to start up, scale up, and shake up the African entrepreneurship ecosystem. NCOPA is for Ethiopian entrepreneurship at work.